as it is now is, I mean, do you think by lowering that percentage, it's going to go up? Probably. You have to give kids fear, because otherwise, they're not going to listen. Interesting and somewhat startling statement, I admit. Yeah. Just so people have a sense of how I'm trying to call, I usually try to call a pro and a con, then a con, and then a pro and a con. I try to do a little back and forth uh, where possible. So in that theme, um, I would say that was a con. Uh, <laughs> and the people, I, I think you signed up as a support, so I'm going to call you next. Just a cheer, I guess I get to be the non-con. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Barry Glenn, I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. I am in support of this bill, but the first statement I would like to make is, for the second time today, let the record show that Senator Groen's question was right on the mark. What I would suggest to the committee is that you delete, delete from lines 13 to 21. Simply wipe them out. Senator Groen is absolutely correct. They repeat word for word what is in lines 4 through 12 for no purpose. And then on line 22, change small b in parens to Roman 2. So then you will have Roman 1, which is what happens to anyone 18 years of age or older, and Roman 2 with regard to those under 18, the parents are notified, and then for those under 21, there is another option. Because half of my testimony was going to be the havoc that would be wreaked if, in fact, this second section were to be passed as part of the law because what it does is bring in individuals who are under the age of 17. Because of the wording there, 21 and under, it brings in minors who are generally treated in the juvenile justice system. It brings them into the criminal system. I, I'm certain that's not what the sponsors want. And all you have to do is delete that section. With regard to the bill itself, the effects of a marijuana conviction on young people involve inability to be employed in um, most of the government agencies to join the military. It means that they cannot get student loans to go on to higher education if you have a drug conviction. There are enormous penalties assessed, to, especially to young people, in terms of their lives after they've been arrested for a marijuana offense. I would suggest to you, I'm going to give you four numbers, 500,000, 200,000, fewer than 10,000 and zero. Those are deaths from drug use, not driving and killing someone because you're high on dope or because much more often you're drunk. Those are deaths from the use of the drug. I do this in classrooms all the time, the kids never get it. And I'm not going to ask you questions because I don't get to ask you questions. <laughs> but the 500,000 deaths is from tobacco. The 200,000 deaths is from alcohol. The fewer than 10,000 deaths is from heroin and other illegal drugs. And the zero is from marijuana. There is not a single recorded statistic of any individual in this country, or to my knowledge, worldwide, who has died because of the overuse of marijuana. Does that mean that people don't die making mistakes after they use dope? It certainly does not. Just as it doesn't mean that you don't die when you are drunk and do something stupid. But the death from alcoholism is about 200,000 a year in this country. And those are statistics for the United States. Marijuana is not a vituant. There is no true addiction to marijuana. And I was very glad to hear that the representative from the Attorney General's office didn't talk about it as a gateway drug. Because the only reason that it is, is because it's illegal. Were it not illegal, you would never be exposed to the other illegal drugs, which are far more dangerous. We can all grow it. The former um, majority leader of the House had a whole bunch of marijuana plants in her backyard that she didn't even know just because it's a weed. And the reality is 
We could grow it here in New Hampshire. I lived in Hawaii for five years, and I didn't know a single person who didn't have marijuana on their property because it's a weed. And when the seeds blow in the wind, they take root in the ground and they grow. Is it a, a benign weed that doesn't do any harm to anyone? Absolutely not. But you can also eat too much basil. The reality is that marijuana is not a dangerous drug. The danger in marijuana is that we treat it as a criminal activity and then we charge our young people and destroy their lives. Is it a mind-altering substance? It absolutely is. Do I think kids ought to be smoking? I absolutely do not. But I don't think that they should be smoking tobacco either. And we don't put them in jail for doing that. And I don't think they should be drinking Bud Light. And we don't put them in jail for doing that. I think we should stop putting people in jail for using a substance that, while it is not good for them, is not a source of criminal, ought not to be a source of criminal activity. And Mr. Chair, I'll shut up. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going to say thank you, but not for that. I'm going to take questions. <laughs> Are there questions for this? I have a question, because I've heard this before, uh, when the bill was around before, which is the ramifications for uh, young people who then have a conviction of uh, possession of marijuana and then issues with respect to student loans. Because I've heard people say that's an issue, and I've heard people say that's not an issue. So could you walk me through that? Well, Senator, having, having two adult children who mercifully never had a conviction for anything um, other than bad judgment, and that was a conviction uh, sent by their mother, um, <laughs> when you fill out, and, and I took plus loans for both of my kids, when you fill out the form requesting federal student aid, you have to specify if you have a drug conviction. And if you do, now, I, I don't know this personally because, as I said, my two kids, fortunately, were never in this position. But they did have, my son had one friend who was, and I tried to help him walk through the morass. And as it turned out, this was a kid who did not have a lot of money, he was very bright, and he did not get his federal student aid. And they finally admitted to me that they didn't give him student aid because of the drug conviction. So I, I have an example of one, and I know that's not sufficient to base any policy on. But you do have to answer that question when you fill out a student loan application. And it seems to me they did not ask anything about driving at, uh, while drinking. They didn't ask anything about alcohol or tobacco. They asked about mar uh, a conviction for marijuana use or for drug use. And let me, if I can ask a follow-up question. So if you have, if you, are arrested for possession of marijuana. And then what we've also heard is that the police aren't, uh, this is a second hand, I'm not going to say that the police have told me this, but second hand that you're not going to be prosecuted for the first or the second time that you're you're caught with or stopped with a certain amount of marijuana. So you're not going to have a conviction until it's the third time. You're going to have a violation. You may have a violation. Is that? So that suggests that you'd be at your third or fourth time before you are convicted of it. You Senator, agree or disagree with that? I absolutely disagree with that, Senator, because what it is, is that what that says is it is up to the individual discretion of individual prosecutors and police officers throughout the state of New Hampshire that kid A, who's a good kid and I know is dad, we're not going to let, you know, we're not going to let him out. We're not going to charge him. We're going to put the fear of God in him. We're going to scare him. But he's not going to be prosecuted. But the kid in the mobile home park, or the kid who's maybe had some trouble, or the kid who's poor, that kid is going to be nailed. That kid is going to be prosecuted. Because if you leave it up to discretion, that means that the law is not the law. It is the discretion of the police officers to enforce it in one case and to not enforce it in the other. I don't think that's a law that ought to remain. But Ms. Ebel, I didn't, in, I didn't introduce the, a nefarious discrimination suggestion into my question. My question is applicable to anyone. And so it's not applicable to, I mean, I see what you're saying about discretion, but that's not at all where I was going. So I want to be very clear, that I, and I'm not assuming that that's happening. Senator, it is. <coughs> and that's why I answered the question the way I did. It is happening. Further questions, Senator Forsyth. Mr. Chair, and uh, kind of a follow-up to that question. Um, I mean, well, actually, it's not a follow-up to the question. Let me make it an independent question. 
you know, as, as you said, there's there's potentially selective enforcement. Actually, um, Ms. Eckel kind of admitted that and claimed that that's the case. What are do you have any statistics on you know other your states uh, in terms of minorities? You know, percentage of minority arrests versus. Uh, non-minorities, um, other demographics like that, you know, what, what are the resulting arrest profiles of the people that we see? Senator Forsyth, nationwide, the new admittees to the prisons nationwide, collectively, the new admittees are approximately 67 percent marijuana or minor drug convictions. The new people coming into prisons nationwide. And I can get a study for you. It's going to take me a little time, but I can get a study for you if you would be interested in reading that. With regard to, oh God, what's the beginning of your question, Senator? Demographics of people. With regard to the demographics, um, it is much more likely that young men, especially, who are African American, are going to be in jail on drug crime charges. As a matter of fact, in some urban communities in the country, three quarters of the young men between the ages of 17 and 35 are in jail or have been jailed primarily on drug offenses. The statistics are startling. They are geared toward and swayed toward younger people and minorities being treated completely differently and completely, I think, erroneously by the system. I apologize. Last one, one more follow-up. Uh, you, you brought up 67% for minor drug drug charges. I, I'd really like to see that statistic because uh, I asked the question about how many people are in prison in New Hampshire that would, um, you know, were costing $35,000 a year, and I didn't get a, a straight answer from that yet. Um, I did hear from Ms. Eckel that she says we don't convict very often on minor marijuana charges. So I'd be interested if you have if you can find statistics in, for New Hampshire on that um, and what the exact statistics nationwide are. Senator, I, I will try to get you the statistics nationwide and when a study was done in New Hampshire several years ago, the suggestion was at the state prison that it was it was above 50 percent. And I, I, but I didn't say I didn't say minor drug charges because I don't know what a minor drug charge is, but on marijuana specifically. Um, the study said that there were that more than 50 percent of the new admittees every year um, were on marijuana charges. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Thank How you, are you doing? Jen, very well. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <coughs> Tough act to follow, but. I hope I'm up to it. <clears throat> for the record, my name is Matt Simon. I work as a legislative analyst for the Marijuana Policy Project. I live in Goffstown, New Hampshire. And I'm not here to argue really for or against the bill. In general, I support the idea of reducing penalties for marijuana possession in New Hampshire's penalties are up to a year in jail and up to a $2,000 fine. But I mainly want to give some clarity to, if I can, there have been so many marijuana bills that people call me after all of them and think that it's the one that I'm working on and it's not. So people get jumbled up and you hear what's going on at the state house. We have marijuana decriminal legalization. What I've given you is a little brief history that I think explains how we got to where we are. I'm not going to go through it. I'm not going to take up your, your time. I'll be happy to answer any questions about it, of course. But this issue has struck me, and I'm glad I get to go after the kids because I've been thinking about this a lot. I didn't try marijuana until I was in college. I was one of those square kids at my high school who gave everybody else grief about it and said it was going to kill your brain cells, which is not true, scientifically false. I hope nobody in this room is telling, their, telling people that it kills brain cells. It doesn't. Prove it. There's not a study that shows that. But anyway, there are harms associated with marijuana. There absolutely are. I don't claim it's harmless. But when I was in high school, people were, it's the same story as what we just heard. Despite the laws, Kids are using it. It's it's a thing. It even makes it cooler. It seems like the fact that it's illegal for some of them. So when I went to college, my freshman year, helped a friend of mine was writing a paper on this subject: should marijuana be legal or not? I had always assumed up to that point that a bunch of smart scientists had gotten together and studied all this stuff. How do these substances affect? What's the science here? What are the real harms? 
And when I studied the history of this issue, I found the opposite of that. I found propaganda. I found an Orwellian memory hole, if you will, a book I'd recently read in 1994. This stuff, so much of it, has just been forgotten by history. The fact that, that cannabis, which is the scientific name given the substance in 1753, was used as a medicine in the United States from the mid-1800s to 1937. In 1942, it was ripped out of the pharmacopoeia. There were dozens of pages that explain how marijuana works as a medicine, how cannabis sativa works as a medicine. Removed from circulation, down the memory hole, and back then there was no internet. So where did this information go? Nobody could find it. In 1972, in the early 70s, this was revisited. This book was written in 1973 by the people who worked on the federal government Schaefer Commission, the commission that was founded by President Nixon to study these questions and report. The Controlled Substances Act had been passed in 1970. Marijuana was placed in Schedule I provisional based on the report that was supposed to be coming out from this commission. When the commission's report came out, it said, wait a minute, we've looked into this and we can't find the harms that you guys are talking about. Yeah, we don't want to, we want to discourage you, but we think the criminal law is too harsh a tool, essentially. Marijuana policy should be left to the states. And that report was buried federally. Eleven states did follow that recommendation that penalties be reduced, beginning with Oregon in 1973. Eleven states did, quote unquote, decriminalize marijuana, by which I don't mean legalization, they reduced the penalty from something criminal involving jail time to something not involving jail time, and in some cases not even allowing arrest. And in these states, what, have, what, what I hear testi testimony against this bill is all based on an assumption that when we reduce penalties, use is going to skyrocket. We have 13 states that have done this. We have government data from those states that show it's not the case. And I only have one copy of this handout, but for example, Alabama and Mississippi. Mississippi decriminalized marijuana in the 70s. Alabama kept up to a year in jail and up to a fine, fine of up to $6,000. You track the teen use rates over time, they're identical in Mississippi and Alabama. It's social factors, cultural factors that, that drive this issue. But the other question that comes up that's a policy question all the time, do states have the right to change their own marijuana policies? Shouldn't we do, be doing this with the federal government? It's a wonderful question. It's a legitimate question across the board. And the answer is there's a process for that. The Controlled Substances Act includes a petitioning process. If you think that something is inappropriately scheduled, marijuana is in Schedule 1, which means high potential for abuse, no accepted medical use. Now, I, I think we've overturned that by bringing dozens of patients to this building over the last few years, that it does have some accepted benefit use. There's been petitions to reschedule at the federal level. They sit in the DEA's office. The DEA is a law enforcement organization that is trusted to rule on these petitions. In 1988, they decided to rule on one of the petitions. They held hearings. All right, this has been here for 10 years. We're finally going to look at it. We're going to have some hearings. The DEA's administrative law judge, Francis Young, after hearing all the testimony, concluded as follows. Marijuana is the safest, therapeutically, one of the safest, therapeutically active substances known to man. It would be absurd, arbitrary, and capricious for the DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and benefits of this substance. That's the DEA's ruling. That's what happens when activists go through the proper channels. After 10 years, they get that ruling. Well, the DEA's administrator, an unelected bureaucrat, ruled, no, nah, we're not going to do that. Six years later, the federal court cases, federal court upholds the DEA administrator's ruling. No, nah, we're not going to consider moving marijuana in Schedule II. And that's how this became a state issue for medical marijuana, the same way decrim had been a state issue. And as far as the Controlled Substances Act is concerned, states are allowed to reduce their penalties. They're allowed to eliminate penalties for marijuana possession. There are two bodies of law. Federal law, which is enforced by federal law enforcement, state law, which is enforced by state and local law enforcement. When people are arrested in this state by state and local law enforcement, they're being arrested under state law. Marijuana can be legalized in D.C. tomorrow. State law stays exactly the same. We would still have to change it here. The only thing we can't do with the CSA is create a positive conflict. And that's, you may have heard with medical marijuana, some states have tried to have 
regulation, tried to have state employees regulating the program. Well, if they were to actually handle the marijuana or distribute it to patients themselves, they, that might be a direct conflict. That might be the kind of thing the state couldn't do. But as far as reducing penalties, eliminating penalties, legalizing marijuana for medical users, as long as you don't involve state employees, the state is empowered to do that, and I would be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Other questions from some guests? Yes. Yeah, quick, quick question. Uh, thank you for sharing testimony. <clears throat> Um, if we look at cocaine or amphetamines, um, heroin, opium, and cannabis or marijuana, where do those sit on the different drug schedulings, which are allowed for medical use, uh, which are not? Can I, can, and I'm sorry, I want uh, to, okay. totally fair question, I just want to re remind that we're not talking about medical marijuana, we're talking about reducing penalties, criminal penalties for it. So, um, that would be helpful. Okay, um, the question then, Cocaine is a Schedule II drug because it has accepted medical use as a local anesthetic. Um, the biggest thing about the scheduling to understand, I think, is relevant to this bill, is that alcohol and tobacco were completely excluded from the scheduling process. Alcohol would have to be at least Schedule II, if not Schedule I, if you could say it had medical utility. It definitely has a high potential abuse, as we've heard. Tobacco would have to be in Schedule I. It has no medical use, high potential for abuse. If we were to start from scratch, study these substances, and create a new drug schedule, what we would wind up with would be so different from what we have today, it would take us all a while to, to, to grab it all. The cultural significance of alcohol having been part of Western culture for hundreds of years has desensitized all of us to the effects of drinking, to the point where if your experience is getting drunk, which that was my experience in, twice or three times in high school, I assume marijuana had to be a lot worse. I tried. Wow, this is not what I thought it was. It's got harms associated with it. We want to keep it away from young people whose brains are still developing, but you know that doesn't mean we throw everybody in jail and keep it away from sick people. So, so of course, I didn't mean to. And an, op 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 an opium, I think, is also scheduled to. Or an opiate. Like I'm not opioids, sure what opium uh, itself is. Con. They're obviously opium based. Drugs are produced millions of pills a year and sell for hundreds of dollars on the black market. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a little bit confused. You mentioned earlier in your testimony that uh, this doesn't have, it doesn't kill brain cells. But then you just said that we should keep it away from young people whose brains are developing. Uh, uh, why? Thank you for the question, Senator. Not because it kills brain cells. It's the effects of marijuana are not as well understood as I would like them to be, and as well as everybody else would like them to be. There is, there have been some studies that show that in developing brains of young people, the marijuana could be tied to an increased incidence of schizophrenia. It's preliminary research. I'm not thoroughly necessarily convinced of all of it, but it is there. And just as we don't want kids drinking recreationally, or you know, their brains are still developing, there is a reason for caution here. There's a reason for parents and for society to want to discourage drug use across the board, even marijuana use for young people. But if we're going to treat, continue to treat marijuana like it's heroin or opium, that doesn't seem to work. Kids are now trying this synthetic stuff, which is just a bunch of who knows what plant matter that's been sprayed with cannabinoids that have never been tested on humans. And they're dying, they're, have, they're tripping, they're, you know, one person tried to smoke it out of a Pez dispenser and the plastic killed them. So when you, get, when you do get marijuana out of the way, kids just go for whatever else is available. It was sniffing glue when I was in school, puffing gasoline. When parents, if I was a parent, somebody who died from using an illegal drug, I would probably wish they had been smoking and enjoying it. And that's not an endorsement of marijuana use for you. I hope that clarifies. Thank you very much. Thank you. No further questions. The chair will call the final speaker, Willie Brown. Um, please come forward, Mr. Brown, and identify yourself for the record. I'm Willie Brown. I'm just a private citizen from Salisbury, New Hampshire. I think uh, one of the points that <clears throat> I haven't heard today that is very important, I think we'll really put everything here into perspective today, is that marijuana is very safe and um, we have to remember that just not long ago, there was a, a global commission was set up on the war on drugs. And the group of people that were selected for that group were Paul Volcker, Secretary of Treasury, Kofi Annan, President of the UN, 
president of South America, president of Mexico, Richard Branson, the CEO of uh, Virgin Group and Elders Group in the United Kingdom, and other world leaders. Very intelligent group of people were brought together to look at the war on drugs and how we've come since we declared war on drugs in the 70s. And their conclusion of the Global Commission was, we've lost the war on drugs. We can't stop drugs coming to the U.S. They're always going to be here. When we talk about, you know, if we make marijuana, if we, you know, decriminalize an ounce or a half ounce or less, are more people apt to smoke it or we, 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 more people want to do it or is it going to make it more available? Marijuana is everywhere. Mar anyone can get marijuana that wants it. It's easy to get. It's, it, we're not stopping anybody from getting it by whether we decriminalize the amount or not. And uh, it, it, the recommendation of the Global Commission was this. What they said was, in, the, in their words, is that we need to end criminalization, marginalization, and the stigmatization, stigmatization of the people who use drugs that do not harm others, rather than reinforce common misconceptions about illegal drug markets, drug use, and drug dependence. Encourage experimentation by governments with models of legal regulation of drugs to undermine the power of organized crime and safeguard the health and security of their citizens. This recommendation applies specifically to cannabis, but we also encourage other experiments of decriminalization and legal regulation that can accomplish those objectives and provide models for others. And so what they're basically saying is we need to legalize marijuana. I'm not here to try to legalize marijuana today. I'm just trying to help bring it into perspective. This is not my feelings necessarily, solely my feelings. I, they're shared with the group on the Global Commission for the War on Drugs. And so what we really need to look at is uh, one other thing I want to make a point of that was really incredible that I was completely surprised about. The man that was responsible for making marijuana illegal in America in the 1930s was Harry Anslinger. And this is his view on marijuana. This is very important because I know this was back in 1937. Think of this if you were told this today. This is Guy's opinion. He says, by the tons of it coming to our country, the deadly dreadful poison that racks and tears not only the body, but the very heart and soul of every human being who becomes slave to it in any of its cruel and devastating forms. Marijuana is a shortcut to the insane asylum. Smoke marijuana for one month and what was once your brain will become a storehouse of horrid specters. S smoke hash smoking hashish makes a murderer who kills for the love of killing out of the mildest, mildest mannered man who once laughed at the idea that any habit could ever get him. There are 100,000 marijuana smokers in the U.S. and most of them are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz and swing, causes white women to seek sexual relations with black people. This is the man that, and, and he says, uh, yeah, it said, it, with, with, with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. Sounds like he kind of threw in the kitchen sink in the end there when he was giving his opinions. But the bottom line is, and this guy was good friends with a man named William Hurst who owned papers all across the United States, from New York City to San Francisco. William Hurst had a lot of money tied up in Timberland and was used, used for paper. He got together with Harry Anslinger and they promoted a negative campaign about marijuana across the United States to keep it illegal. And the bottom line is, is the, if, if, a guy, if this is the guy that says marijuana is bad, why he thinks it's bad, I've got a lot of questions for him. Unfortunately, he's not here for me to ask him today. But the reality is, if you skip ahead to 2012, and we look at the global war on, uh, the, the Commission on the Global War on, uh, Mar on Drugs, it, it's, it's evident that, you know, we're at a period where we're not going to stop it, so we need to educate our people about it. It's, it's great to see students here and these groups, the youth groups that are here to work on us. It would be great if down the road we can take education on drugs and share them with these groups and use those tools to educate people and to reduce the amount of stuff that's being done that is negative as far as marijuana. Marijuana is safe. It's very safe. To me, I say, relatively speaking, it's as safe as corn. You know, I mean, ultimately, smoking marijuana has its dangers. The as where the most dangers lie with marijuana. The carcinogens, the, uh, the carbon oxide that some of the students mentioned, they are bad, but there's other delivery systems for marijuana. You can eat new marijuana. There's butters, there's oils, there's cookies, there's all kinds of ways that you can use marijuana. Marijuana that is eaten is actually more effective and lasts longer. And, and down the road, I think what you're going to find is people that use marijuana are going to probably eat it rather than smoke it because of the health benefits of just eating it. But the reality is, is nobody's ever died from marijuana. A thousand people died last year from aspirin. A thousand people from aspirin. 
And when we're here today going, boy, we, this evil marijuana, what do we do with it? What do we do with it? But the reality is, it's not what we were told it was. It, that was all propaganda from the 30s. Uh, Harry Anslinger went from 1937 right up to the Nixon administration with the DEA in 74. He was... Brown, I'm sorry to interrupt. We've already had one history okay. lesson. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, su you support, I haven't checked in, you favor the bill because marijuana has beneficial as opposed to negative characteristics. Yeah, it's time that we looked at it for what it really is and, and get rid of the stigmatism, stigmatization that we've told all these years from the 30s that it was, that, that it isn't. You know, we just know too much about it now. The world knows about it. Since the internet, as everybody knows, the information travels fast now. The truth slowly rises to the top, and that's what's happening. Over time, everybody's learning about it, but that's the direction that we need to be looking at, is educating people and, uh, and looking at it for what it is. Thank you very much. I appreciate that every question. I actually wasn't planning on speaking. Uh, the main reason is uh, some, some claims. Uh, Representative Seth Cohn representing Merrimack 6. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wasn't going to speak on this in part because um, uh, with, the, with the industrial hemp bill, I didn't want to contaminate the, the issue. However, there were some claims made today that I think really do need to be addressed. And in due deference to, to Senator Luther, I actually brought a real scientific That's study, what I'm and <laughs> right. what this is, um, it, you, you may or may not have come across this, this is a, two th a November 2011 study relating medical marijuana laws, and the reason for that is we have credible, legal uh, uh, states where we can do scientific studies and traffic fatalities, and, and the point I'm making is you have heard, if we do this, we're going to see accidents occur, et cetera, it's sending the wrong message. In fact, the studies show the opposite. It says when we allow more marijuana use, traffic fatalities drop by about 10%. And so just to point out that there is another side to this, um, I'm just going to pass these in and you can have it. But my point is there are lots of credible scientific studies. I came across that one nearly by listening, went to my tablet and said, I know that's not true, where's the facts, and came across that, I just wanted to pass that on to you. And uh, I would be glad to go ahead and talk more about uh, Harry Anslinger and all sorts of other stuff in the next, in the next one. So, <laughs> uh, seeing no questions for Representative Cohn, I'm going to have someone